Good afternoon. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to present some information to you. Uh, as Dr. Mukhtar uh, present, indicated earlier, I'm an extension engineer working in the University of Arkansas and I've been working with uh, livestock and poultry manure management issues for a number of years now. And today's topic is really one of dealing with the larger scale concept of uh, setting up and managing a composting operation or a set of composting facilities. Uh, Dr. Mukhtar just presented some information in terms of the management of the pile itself. What I'm going to present is some information on the management of the facilities and the surrounding areas and site placement. With that, go ahead and uh, move on. With uh, in composting facilities, we really need to be thinking in terms of proper planning, implementation to get the facility in place, then con ongoing maintenance. And really what we're trying to do is two things kind of combine together. The first is to mitigate adverse impacts, and the second is to generate positive benefits. And both of these take place in the area of environmental protection, uh, neighbor relations, and also the general farming operation in terms of efficiencies and labor and working conditions. Um, because, you know, these are, if we can't address all three of these issues, we're not really trying to make the overall system work on a long-term uh, sustainable basis. Uh, the other thing we need to be aware of is when we make a decision to address one of these concern areas, uh, it is very likely to have an impact or an interaction with one of the other areas. So these areas are all interrelated. And the other thing that we need to remember is the concepts that I'm talking about here today uh, quite often apply not only to the mortality composting facilities, but also to general farming practices as well. Potential mortality composting impact areas, um, we typically think in terms of the water management, and when we say water management in this particular presentation, we're not talking about the management of water within the pile. What we're talking about is the role that water makes in terms of transferring or carrying uh, chemicals, microorganisms, or particulate matter away from the composting facilities into receiving waters, and obviously we want to uh, prevent that. The other aspect of water management is avoiding the onflow of water that interrupts with the proper water management within the pile. Uh, nuisance areas, uh, as you might expect, uh, they range in scale from you barely notice something to it's strongly objectionable. Uh, also, we need to think in terms of who's doing the noticing and who's being strongly offended or uh, objects to a particular practice. It may be on the farm only, it may be the farm's spouse, or it may be a downwind neighbor. Uh, farming working conditions and efficiencies. Uh, I think a lot of times we tend to overlook the importance of making sure that we manage the farm resources not only from a dollar and cents perspective but also uh, the time it takes to do something and how hard it is to do it because if it takes a lot of time and it's hard to do it's less likely to be done well and it has adverse impacts on other farming operations. Uh, so we need to be thinking about that when we look at the farm working conditions and efficiencies. General approach to addressing these concerns, and again, this is not just for the mortality composting facilities, but also apply to other things, is it really boils down to the concept of the two questions. Uh, what should I be doing and what should I avoid be doing? And of course, to answer those two questions, it's going to take some careful consideration of what are your options, selecting between those options, implementing the option that you have chosen correctly, then managing that option that you implemented and doing it in such a way that you achieve the full benefits and avoid uh, the things that you're trying to avoid. And of course, that's what that means is you need information. Uh, and the for today's subject, we are presenting the information in this webcast. We made a reference to the proceedings that are available from the 
Langston University for the composting workshop. Uh, and the site link is in your chat, chat box there. That's one excellent source of reference materials. And that, in turn, provides links to additional references uh, and sources of information. And, of course, you can always go to your local land-grant university through your county extension offices and also through your NRCS uh, offices, conservation district offices, as well as other organizations. So if you've got your information in place, uh, you need to be working through that. You need to make your plans, implement your plans, and ultimately you need to be evaluating your plan not only during the making and implementation but also after you put things in place because very rarely is something perfect the first time out and there's always going to be opportunity to tweak it, maybe at the end of the design life of the facilities, but there's an evaluation process in that. So we need to make sure we have our information sources. Uh, we need to make sure that we know the farm working conditions and situations when we're making our plans. And we also need to consider what are the other uh, outside inputs that may be available, both from an information source perspective, maybe from a cost share perspective. The final thing that you see recommended quite often is the idea of, well, sketch it out. Draw a picture of the, whole, the facility. Uh, if you've got a fairly simple facility with a minimal amount of infrastructure being developed and it's fairly movable from place to place, uh, the necessity of sketching it out may not be as high. Uh, but when you start talking about uh, complicated situations and you've got a lot of activity taking place in a small space and your areas of concerns, uh, receiving waters and things like that are closer, uh, it really can be beneficial to sketch the thing out on paper uh, to help track things out to make sure you're catching everything that needs to be caught. Key concepts in this whole process is we want to keep the clean water clean. We're trying to protect water. Uh, uh, from an environmental perspective. And the other thing is if we're keeping the clean water clean, that probably usually means that we're not letting that clean water get in the way of our, of our operation and we're reducing mud problems. Uh, we also want to manage the potential pollutant materials in the areas uh, that the water will interact with. Uh, we want to take the water that interacts with that and starts to run off. We need to make sure we're treating it in such a way that it's acceptable uh, as it moves farther away from the facility. Uh, we definitely want to minimize our nuisance, nuisance considerations or conditions. Uh, we need to keep the operation as inconspicuous to the public as possible. Uh, it's just a reality of human nature that uh, what you don't notice won't raise con uh, near as many concerns as something that is noticeable and visibly uh, objectionable by the part of the person who's doing the noticing. Um, we also need to make sure that we make our management and maintenance part of the daily task. Uh, you can have the best facility in the world, but if it's on a farm that the guy does not want to manage it that way, it's not going to be... Uh, nearly as likely to be successful as if it matches up with the farmer preferences. Okay, focusing at water runoff management. Uh, we need to remember that water has the potential of carrying nutrients, sediments, microorganisms from the point where it collects or, or comes in contact with it to where it flows into, such as receiving ponds, water, and streams. Uh, it raises concerns about the environmental impact, human health concerns, possibility of animal health as well. And from a farm management perspective, uh, uh, excess water creates more mud, which increases traffic problems and potentially animal health concerns as well. The other thing we need to remember about runoff uh, rainfall and runoff volumes is that when rain lands on the surface of the soil, there's really only three things that can happen to it. Uh, one is it can infiltrate into the soil. The second option is it can run off the soil. And the third option is it can evaporate back into the air. Now, the soil conditions and the amount of vegetation play a role in how much goes to which fraction, but that's really the only choices that, or the only things that can happen with water. To kind of give you a feel for runoff volumes, each inch of rain to a horizontal area will generate about 0.62 gallons per square foot of runoff if the evaporation and infiltration are zero. Uh, 
For example, if you've got a one-inch rain and it hits a 25 by 100 foot roof, that's 2,500 square feet, and you're talking about 1,500 gallons of water. Uh, if you're talking in a pasture situation, a one-inch rain uh, where half of it runs off, uh, one acre of pasture is 43,560 square feet, you're talking in excess of 13 gallons, 13,000 gallons of runoff. So you can see it doesn't take much rain to generate a fair bit of water. The runoff management concerns or key concepts are really a subset we talked about earlier. Keep the clean water clean, manage the concern areas, and treat the runoff water. In keeping the clean water clean, really the concept that we are in place is you want to redirect the flow of water so you don't have water running on to, uh, excuse me, you want to redirect the flow of water onto this facility so that the clean water is not coming in contact with the dirty area water. So that means if you've got water coming off of roofed areas or upslope grassed areas, uh, it may be appropriate to take that water and route it somewhere else. Now we need to remember that we don't necessarily need to reroute all runoff water. If the water is running off across the grassed area and it's not coming in contact with an area of concern, uh, there really is nothing that needs to be done with that on a, as a general rule. Managing the potential pollutant and the materials uh, in those areas. Think of this as your exposed uh, compost piles. If you have outside composting taking place, it may be your dry materials pile or it may be your uh, storage of your materials uh, after your compost is taking place or in your second curing phases. Uh, ideally, you'd like to have these areas protected from the weather so they don't have direct rainfall falling on them. However, roofs and tarps and things like that may not be practical or cost effective uh, for small farms or farms in which you have an infrequently mortality occurring. Uh, now, this is a place where you need to check with your local rules and regulations to make sure that you comply with what they say. Uh, I know in Arkansas, if you're not using manure as part of your composting ingredient mix, uh, the small facilities exposed piles are acceptable. But if you start talking about using chicken litter or other manure source as part of your organic material, uh, then you have to have cover in place. Uh, other states will probably have you set up just a little bit differently. Uh, you may be, um, for outside piles, as Saka uh, talked about earlier, you may want to have them shaped so they shed water or you may want to have them shaped so they catch water, all depending on uh, whether you're in a part of the country where you have minimal rainfall and you actually need the extra water or you have more rainfall and you're trying to avoid moisture movement into the pile. Uh, the other thing we need to be thinking about with these areas is you really want to maximize the amount of area that's got good vegetative cover so you're holding the soil in place so you don't have sediment issues generated from that area by itself and you have the ability to treat any water that's flowing and moving across that area and also maximizes the infiltration rates. Uh, and by the same token, we want to minimize those bare soil areas uh, that do increase the amount of rainfall that runs off and increases the exposure of the runoff water to materials that we need to be concerned about. When we're looking at managing these non-vegetated areas or these heavy use areas, it all starts with good design. Uh, we won't need to make sure it's not too large or too small. Um, it's got to be large enough to achieve what you're doing, but small enough that you're not just chewing up land for no reason. Uh, you've got to consider your animal and equipment movement patterns, uh, consider your runoff diversions, your proper drainage issues, and you also, want, as a rule, want to try to minimize the flow length of the water flowing across these areas or the water flow as the rainfall hits it directly and moves off. Uh, you may possibly need things like gravel with or without geotextile or concrete or maybe some other amendments such as coal ash products or uh, lime stabilization, uh, depending on how heavy the usage is and what the load-bearing capacity you need for that particular area. Uh, 
when you are looking at these heavy use areas that are uh, denuded, uh, the question that you need to think in terms of how often do I need to scrape or clean these areas? If it's soil and gravel surfaces, uh, probably not very often, if at all. If you're talking concrete, you may need to scrape more often in the cold issue products. Uh, products. Uh, scraping frequency will vary, uh, but I will. My experience is you need to scrape very likely because you can actually excavate that material if you're not careful. But the scraping frequently depends on quite a lot on how you're using this area. When you are treating runoff water, uh, at the next phase of this. It's really largely a matter of isolation uh, distance and providing uh, enough distance to allow nature to do its work because vegetation and the soil structure uh, do a good job of treating the potential pollutants that are in the water. Uh, and it provides that treatment that we talked about between the area of concern and the receiving area. On the screen, you see some suggested um, setback distances or separation distances. This list came from the on-farm composting handbook from uh, NRAs. Uh, there are other uh, sources of information, and I would suggest that you look for local sources or confirmation from local sources that these distances are appropriate for your particular settings and situations. Treating the heavy use runoff, uh, in addition to those offset distances I talked about, uh, there are some other options that may be appropriate to consider. Um, usually, you want to think about it very carefully before deciding to go this route. Uh, the first is to collect the water, store the water, then do a land application. Uh, that is usually to be avoided because it's obviously going to increase your cost from the building of your storage structure and the long-term cost of your water management, water pumping. And you also open the door for an increased likelihood of regulations that need to be considered. The other approach is um, really an overland flow or veg enhanced vegetation treatment system. Um, Run kind of runs the gamut from filter strips to the more engineered design of vegetated treatment systems. Uh, in these, you're usually talking about either sheet flow, uniform flow of water across the material, or you're talking about a sprinkler applied water. Uh, you may be able to utilize existing pattern, uh, pastures, or you may find yourself where you need to go in and do grading and reseeding. But again, uh, it this would be preferable over to water collection and application from long-term storages, but it's something that will tend to be uh, cost more up front, and you do need to pay attention to what your long-term management costs and practices will be. On nuisance issue management, um, we have to remember what defines a nuisance really depends on the perspective of the individual making that determination. Uh, the person managing the compost pile is liable to have a very different opinion of what a nuisance is than the person who is downwind and has nothing to do with the farming operation. Um, perspective really kind of defines uh, what is considered a timely correction. Uh, if you're the one managing the pile, oh, I'll get around to it next week, that may be timely. Uh, the person downwind who nothing care for odors and flies and dust, uh, timely mean, mean I want it done yesterday. Uh, and again, it goes back to what is acceptable and what's not. Uh, unacceptable conditions, if we think about it, or situations, uh, can result in poor neighbor relations. And of course, that comes back and it takes time and effort on the part of the facility management uh, to address those neighbor relation issues, uh, liable to result in complaints to the regulators, which uh, in turn may result in regulatory visits. And again, that takes time and effort on the part of the uh, farm management. Proper nuisance uh, management, there are some active approaches uh, that can take place. Uh, first is just design for your needs and your preferences. Make sure what's designed fits the needs and make sure it fits the preferences, and that goes a long ways to making sure that it will actually be implemented correctly and address these nuisance concerns. 
uh, we need to manage the composting process is, uh, and go back to the technical components uh, that Dr. Mukhtar covered and some of the concerns that will be brought up uh, in other materials. Uh, we also need to remember that we don't need to store mortality. Uh, we need to, when the animal is uh, found, it needs to be composted immediately. It doesn't need to be piled up on the ground beside the barn for a few days before it goes into a composting pile. Uh, we need to make sure that you completely surround the mortality with carbon uh, that's filtering odors and it's absorbing water. It's isolating the animal mortality from flies and other uh, vectors, especially on the carnivores. Uh, we need to make sure that we're not introducing situations where we have uh, dogs and coyotes dragging mortality around the landscape. And we definitely need to avoid the pictures that Dr. Mukhtar indicated earlier. Uh, my experience has been that if you prevent the carnivores, the coyotes and the neighbor's dogs and those kind of animals from ever figuring out that there is mortality in the pile, uh, they will pretty much leave that pile alone. But once they learn where they can find uh, a free lunch, uh, they'll, know, they'll learn to go dig for it. Uh, in those situations, I have heard some pretty good luck from outside piles being protected by as simple as a single strand of electric fence at the appropriate height to dissuade neighbors, dogs, and coyotes. Uh, you also, of course, compost walls and panels may also be uh, considered as well. The other approach, nuisance management, is really kind of an isolation concept. Uh, really, it's how far is it away from those who are going to find them object objectionable. Uh, the first step is really visual. The farther away it is, you're not really going to be able to see it as much. In the upper picture, you can see uh, on the center tree, there's a pile at the base, and that is a compost pile uh, containing several uh, beef cow heifers. At this particular situation, it really doesn't look offen offensive, um, but it would be noticeable if you see a tractor down there loading the pile. Uh, the other thing with the visual barriers is you need to think about what the landscaping is and where the terrain is and you know how visible it is, uh, and if it's not any way to make it Sometimes you can't make something invisible. You can't completely hide it. In those particular situations, really what you ought to be thinking about in terms of, well, if you are going to see it, will you see it in such a way that it's not really that noticeable? Um, design considerations that you need to think about. We need to design and build to match the mortality needs. It needs to be properly sized. We need to match the site and location needs. Uh, we want it far enough away from the facility that we address some animal health concerns, but we don't need it so far away it's inconvenient to get the mortality to it. Uh, we don't need to be siting our facilities immediately adjacent to a receiving water. We need to make sure it's isolated from that. As I indicated earlier, you want to make sure that it's either not visible from the neighbors or uh, blends into the background so it's not noticeable. Uh, we have to make sure we match, meet our regulatory and cost share requirements. And the thing I think quite often that is overlooked is it needs to match the operator preferences. And we need to remember for something to match the operator preferences, the operator needs to understand what the long-term management of that facility is going to take, both in terms of labor and fuel costs and other things. Um, we also need to think in terms of all-weather access. Do you need all-weather access? Uh, do you need access for the water to make sure your composting mix is managed correctly? Uh, do you have a need for making sure that you can light the site uh, if you need to be in the pile in the dark? Uh, if you're going to be out there in the dark a lot, uh, lighting sources would be handy. If it's occasional, maybe the front end light, the headlights of a truck or a tractor may be enough. In summary, uh, we really need to be thinking about with our facilities of keeping the clean water clean, managing these areas that uh, are potential pollutant sources for uh, that come in contact with water, 
We need to treat the water that comes in contact with these areas. We need to manage our, our, nutri manage our nuisance conditions. Uh, we really need to keep our operations as inconspicuous from the public as possible. It's a classic case of out of sight, out of mind. And the final point is we really need to make sure that the management and maintenance is part of the ongoing process with our composting facilities.